Welcome everybody, my name is Stefano Braghiroli, uh, I'm a lecturer at the European College of the University of Tartu and a researcher in the field of European studies and, most, uh, and more specifically in the field of the European Parliament and voting behaviour in the European Parliament. Um, and today we are going to talk about the dimension of European citizenship and how it substantiates in uh, its uh, um, active uh, connotation. Uh, when it comes to the definition of active citizenship, uh, it's important to start from the definition of citizenship itself. Uh, citizenship itself uh, implies, by definition, a certain degree of activism. Um, citizen uh, differentiates itself from the concept of subject exactly for a certain level of activism or for a certain degree of participation in the management of the uh, polity. Uh, and in this respect, we can draw back these concepts to the very original idea of the Greek polis. Um, over time, two different concepts, two different ideas of citizenship developed. The first one could be defined as liberal individualist conception, which stresses much more the individual role of the uh, citizen uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, enjoying at best its individual rights and its role uh, as a single member of the society, and the more civic republican conception which uh, identifies the citizen as an active member of a collective group. Uh, therefore, uh, a citizen which not only acts for itself, but acts for a broader, um, for a broader dimension. And that therefore uh, um, characterizes itself uh, as an empowered, active and engaged citizen. And here somehow we find our uh, um, our starting point for the definition of active citizenship. In this respect, we should look at the um, idea of citizenship as a uh, uh, bi-directional model, uh, consisting of two main dimensions, one internal and external, and the other one individual and uh, collective. Um, it carries a sense of belonging which uh, um, identifies the citizen within uh, the broader uh, community and it relates uh, the citizens with the outside, the, uh, the external dimension. Um, the external dimension which in most of the cases characterizes citizenship as an exclusive concept in the sense that, you know, being a part of a, uh, of a citizenry um, implies that you are not part of something else. Um, in the traditional vision of citizenship, uh, exclusiveness is one of the dimensions. Um, the model of active citizenship, or the dimensions of active citizenship, substantiates into four generally uh, defined components, uh, which in a modern state, in a modern society, uh, take the form of a political dimension, uh, which implies political rights and political duties towards the state and the political community. Uh, the social dimension, which in a way uh, brings together uh, uh, the individuals of a given society and which, for example, reflects into dimensions such as solidarity, uh, common bonds, uh, uh, social interaction and sense of community. Uh, there is a cultural dimension which uh, implies a sense of common heritage, a sense of commonality um, and which in a way combines commonality and diversity within the same society giving a sense of a common belonging uh, along cultural lines. Uh, then we have a last dimension which can be defined as the economic dimension which in a way uh, defines the economic, social economic interactions within a given society and within which uh, a citizen uh, contributes actively, let's say, for the economic development of the uh, society. Uh, if you think of these four components, in all these four components there is always a more individual and a more collective dimension which reflects the uh, idea of citizenship. 
Um, one of the key ingredients uh, to define and to understand the uh, idea of active citizenship is the uh, concept of social capital, which uh, according to many, uh, many observers, is a key ingredient, is a key factor for the emergence of a healthy and aware uh, active citizenship. Um, this concept was originally defined by Putnam, um, and in a way it can be defined as a network uh, or a network of people, network of uh, citizens that together share norms, values and understandings that facilitate cooperation among the groups. Um, Putnam substantiated this uh, idea in, in his quite uh, well-known work, Bullying Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. Uh, there he studies how uh, associationism, being part of associations, groups, NGOs, informal networks, declined in the early uh, 2000, uh, late 90s in the US, and how that affected the possibility for citizens to interact and to, um, and to create uh, common bonds and active citizenry. Uh, Putnam identifies three main dimensions, three main components of a social capital. Bonds, which basically links people based on a sense of common identity. Bridges, that somehow uh, stretches the sense of common and shared identity. And linkages, which connects different levels and different ladders and social groups. And this is basically, uh, linkages are the key components for the, uh, the main key components for the development of an active civil society. Uh, this, in a way, could be opposed to the concept of amoral familism, which was defined by Banfield in the late 50s, and which, in a way, connotes this idea of taking care only of your own private circle, of your family, of your extended family, of your group of friends, but not thinking of a broader projection at the society level. Uh, when it comes to the definition of citizenship, um, we could start from the so-called traditional definition of citizenship. A tradition, a definition of citizenship which, in a way, uh, relates the citizen to its own political community, to its own polity, to its own state, if we want to say. And therefore, we could define citizenship uh, as a membership to a polity, that is a political community, which implies a bidirectional relationship. On the one hand, a sense of allegiance uh, that, the citizens, uh, that the citizen has towards its political community. On the other hand, uh, a, a duty of protection that that state or that political community exerts towards that citizen. Uh, and again here we come to um, touch two dimensions. The first one is in, is in a way distinguishing citizen from subject. Uh, citizen implies already a certain degree of activeness, uh, a certain degree of participation to the public sphere. And if we think of the first idea of citizenship, therefore we can think of the Greek polis, of the Greek political community, in which the citizens were involved directly in the management of the uh, political thing. Uh, when it comes to the subject, simply the subject is subject to a political community, but doesn't actively participate to it. Uh, another key component of the traditional idea of citizenship is indeed uh, the, its very strong uh, uh, linkage with the idea of nationality, with the idea of the uh, of belonging, or of the traditional sense of belonging, based according to the German definition on the two components of Blut und Boden, that is basically the blood and the land, and this, in a way, um, reflects pretty much in the traditional ways that today we have to acquire citizenship. Use a sanguinis based on uh, ethnicity, on blood, and use a soli that is related to the territory. And this, of course, carries a sense of exclusivity and a sense of exclusion in many cases. Uh, this idea of commonality between nation and state uh, somehow originated from the, um, uh, from the um, idea of nation-state, which touched this peak 
in between the uh, 19th uh, century and the end of the Second World War. But this, of course, um, entrenching too much the idea of nation, state, and citizenship, um, raises a question. To what extent a citizen um, enjoys and is granted fully and equal rights in terms of civil rights, political rights, social rights, economic rights, in a way that is not necessarily connected to nationality uh, and not necessarily connected to the sense of belonging to nation and therefore to Blut und Boden. Um, Starting from 1945, starting from the end of the Second World War, we started to witness a decline, we started to witness a, um, a collapse of the idea of the nation state, which appears to be increasingly in crisis. Um, and we started to move, uh, starting uh, the process of European integration and uh, getting more deeper in the construction of the uh, European Union, into a more civic, less identitarian vision of citizenship. Uh, and moving towards the idea of a postmodern idea of state and moving even beyond that. When it comes to the specific case of the European citizenship, uh, it is defined uh, uh, as carried by every person that holds the nationality of a member state. So therefore, it just opposes to the uh, uh, national citizenship. It doesn't substitute it. But it's clearly a challenge to nationalism. Uh, on the other hand, it is challenged by nationalism itself. As we can see, for example, in the light of emergencies of a number of Eurosceptic movements, of new nationalist movements that challenge the very idea of European integration. Uh, exactly because it's less connected to the traditional dimensions of Blut und Boden. Uh, the very idea of European citizenship uh, not only carries direct rights for the European citizens far beyond the sense of national identification, such as, for example, direct representation in the European Parliament and participation in the uh, political life of the Union, so therefore it creates direct rights for the citizens, but it also, again, challenges the very key foundations of the nation-states such as territory, sovereignty, independence, and legitimacy. Uh, and these are, in a way, the key components that traditionally determine the very idea of nation-state and traditional citizenship. Uh, now, I want to show you uh, two examples of a more traditional uh, values and traditional normative basis of uh, citizenship and a more post-materialist, less traditional and um, in a way post-modern idea of uh, citizenship based on European integration. The first uh, one uh, is the uh, preamble of the uh, Constitution of the Republic of Poland. If you go through the, um, the lines that um, uh, start uh, with an invocation of God, you see very strong and uh, traditional uh, appeals to sovereignty, to the nation, uh, to the Christian nature of Poland, uh, to, uh, its, uh, be, to um, uh, the strong uh, connection between nation and state. If you look, on the other hand, at the um, preamble of the Treaty on European Union, which defines uh, the polity uh, of European Union and therefore the, uh, the citizenry of the European Union, it defines the Union as based on much more post-materialist values such as human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, uh, rule of law, respect of human rights, non-discrimination, justice, solidarity, equality. Something which uh, does not imply a sense of national belonging or a um, or a strong dimension of Blut und Boden. Uh, when it comes to the factors that uh, determine a broader uh, uh, sense of belonging and activism uh, at a European and more cosmopolitan level, well, a good starting point uh, um, can be um, the, um, the idea proposed by Jeremy Rifkin, uh, the American sociologist, who started to uh, define and 
uh, discussed about the European dream, a new way of thinking uh, about citizenship, about citizenry and about the polity. Um, he stresses the fact that, you know, European Union uh, as an answer to uh, the tragedies of the Second World War and in a way to the crisis and constant crisis of the nation states uh, is based and is basing itself on a sense of inclusivity, uh, multicultural diversity and in a, in a sense uh, on the idea of shared culture and shared uh, responsibility for a better future. And in a way, he uh, presents the European Union, defined in a way as a European dream, as a stepping stone to define a broader, more global, cosmopolitan community. So in a way, we might ask ourselves, so is the European Union the stepping stone to uh, move towards a more cosmopolitan community, a more cos cosmopolitan sense of citizenship and a more active citizenship? Well, the, the, the answer is yes and no. Uh, on the one hand, clearly, the European Union as an aspiration and European integration as an aspiration uh, to expand, as an aspiration to include and an aspiration to enlarge. Uh, on the other hand, um, we are, if we think of the debate, of the current debate that goes on when it comes to the enlargement, when it comes you know, to the characterization and the definition of what EU is and where it's going, we can see that many of the components that are debated are pretty much, re pretty much related to traditional dimensions, such as, for example, the debate on what is Europe, what is not, what are the borders of Europe, uh, and can we universalize the uh, European values beyond Europe, in a way we might um, replicate those that can be defined as the traditional sins of Europe, uh, the EU uh, in a way um, might be perceived as, a, um, as bringing a universal but also imperialist message in a way, and in a way uh, Europe traditionally had its own sins such as Eurocentrism, colonialism, imperialism, and so on and so forth, which in a way makes it less credible in the eyes of the outside world uh, to represent a model of uh, integration. On the other hand, it's undeniable that by the process of European integration, well, peace became a, a, a reality and a stable reality in this continent, while on the other hand, in the past, Europe was uh, destroyed and uh, um, uh, and devastated by wars uh, year after year. Um, one way to look at um, at the potential for the European Union or for European integration to become the stepping stone for a more cosmopolitan uh, creation is to look uh, at. The, at what the European citizens think. What are the key elements that define their sense of being European, their sense of being European citizens? And here we see a mix of traditional and post-materialist components. When it comes to traditional, we can see common history, common culture, common religious heritage, uh, and in a way geography. But when it comes to the post-materialist components, well, we have, for example, democratic values and high level of social protection. So in a way we have, uh, again, components which are more related to a, an identitarian dimension, this dimension uh, that we can still define as blut und boden, traditional one, and other dimension which goes beyond that, more post-materialist, uh, more value related. Uh, when it comes to uh, the sense of belonging of the European citizen, and in a sense how many of them are ready to move beyond, how many of them somehow can represent or could be defined as the avant-garde of this like uh, cosmopolitan uh, creation, well we can see that uh, among the European citizens the still the stronger sense of identification goes to the nation state. Uh, around 95% uh, of the European citizens feel relate, feel connected, feel identified with their national uh, community. Uh, a bit lower you find the local dimension, uh, meaning region, meaning city. The European dimension uh, represents a, sen a strong sense of identification for three-fourths of European citizens. While 
only 60% sees themselves reflected in a broader dimension, in a broader dimension um, and in a cosmopolitan dimension. Um, when it comes to moving for a world, therefore, you know, to moving towards a more global dimension, we should take into consideration two main components. The first one is localism, which determines a close uh, a rejection of um, the global dimension. Uh, and this, in a way, uh, might be uh, witnessed by the emergence of new nationalism, of far-right movements, of traditional values, which in a way, or um, uh, parties or groups that are advocates of traditional values and therefore challenge this idea of more global and uh, cosmopolitan Europe. On the other hand, we have globalism, uh, which appeals to a new universalism. Uh, it, in a way, it can be reflected by post-materialist social movements uh, and contraposes, in a way, uh, Europe of the people with the Europe of institutions, elites and big capital. What we generally see is a combination of these two components in today's world and in today's Europe in what could be defined as globalism. And if we look at those who might represent this avant-garde of this more global, integrated and uh, cosmopolitan society of citizens of the world, well, uh, the survey uh, clearly shows us that this, um, uh, that this avant-garde is more likely to be found among young people with a good level of education uh, and with positions of uh, autonomous work uh, and with a broader and more active role in their uh, society and in their local community and uh, a higher level of social activism and of civic capital. Thank you.